When solutions are formed, there are two opposing processes that are occurring. The first is called dissolution. Dissolution occurs when the solute breaks apart or dissolves. So if sodium chloride is your solute, it will dissociate or break apart into sodium ions and chloride ions during the process of dissolution. When water is the solvent, the water molecules orient themselves so that the negatively charged oxygens surround each positive cation and the positively charged hydrogens surround each negative anion. Because of the interaction between the charged ions and the partially charged regions of the water molecules, the salt begins to break apart. At first, the only thing that occurs is dissolution, but eventually crystallization will begin to form as well. And crystallization is just the opposite process. Crystallization occurs when the ions collide to form a crystalline structure. Eventually, the two processes will occur at equal rates. When the process of dissolution and crystallization are occurring at equal rates, the solution is now at equilibrium. So the amount of sodium chloride that is dissociating is equal to the amount of sodium and chloride ions that are crystallizing. When a solution is at equilibrium, it appears as though the dissolving has stopped, but in reality, both the dissolution process and the crystallization process are occurring at the same time. There are several factors affecting how solutions form. Some of those factors affect the rate of dissolution, which is how fast the solute dissolves in order to form the solution. In order to increase how quickly the solute dissolves, you could stir the solution. By stirring the solution, you are exposing fresh solvent to the solute allowing it to dissolve faster. If you increase the crystal size, however, the solute will dissolve slower. This is because large crystals have a small surface area. The smaller the surface area, the less surface there is for the solvent particles to collide and cause dissolution. On the other hand, if you had very tiny particles, there would be lots of surface area and the greater amount of surface area, the more collisions that will occur between the solvent and the solute, and it will dissolve faster. Increasing the temperature of the solvent also causes the rate of dissolution to increase. This is also related to the number of collisions that are occurring in a certain amount of time. Higher temperatures have particles that are moving around faster. If the particles are moving around faster, they're going to be colliding more often. The more frequently they collide, the faster the rate of dissolution. Increasing the pressure, however, has very little effect on how fast that solute dissolves. Another thing that we can analyze when solutions form is something called solubility. Solubility is defined as how much of a solute dissolves in a given amount of solvent. The solubility of a solute is slightly different depending if the solute is a solid or a gas. Increasing the temperature of the solvent causes solid solutes to increase their solubility. In other words, you can dissolve more of the solute in warm water than you can in cold water. However, the solubility of gases is different. If you increase the temperature of the solvent, less gas can actually be dissolved in it, whereas making the solution colder will increase the solubility of the gas. You've probably noticed these effects on solubility in your daily life. For example, when you're changing the temperature of, say, tea, and you take a little bit of sugar and you dissolve it in your tea, and the sugar dissolves in the hot tea, as the tea begins to cool down and reach room temperature, you may notice that small crystals of sugar are settled at the bottom of your cup. That's because as you decrease the temperature of the solution, the solubility of the sugar also decreases. The opposite is true with solutions containing gases. Let's say that you had two different bottles containing soda pop. One bottle was kept at room temperature and the other bottle was kept in the refrigerator. When you pour the pop from the room temperature bottle into a cup, you get lots of fizzing that occurs. This is because the solubility of gases decreases in that warmer solution of pop. 
If, however, you pour from the cold bottle of pop, you will get less fizz at the top of your glass because more gases will stay dissolved in the cold pop relative to the warm pop. Because solids and liquids are condensed states of matter, meaning their particles are, are very close together, increasing the pressure on the system will have very little effect on the solubility of solids. However, increasing the pressure on a system in which gases are being dissolved will increase the solubility of those gases. This relationship between solubility and pressure of gases is known as Henry's Law. Solubility is directly proportional to the partial pressure of the gas on its liquid solvent. So if a gas is dissolved under high pressures, it will have high solubility. Whereas if a gas is dissolved under low pressures, it will have a lower solubility. Remember that graphing any directly proportional relationship will produce a diagonal line, as shown in the graph to the right. In your daily life, you understand Hess's Law in terms of opening up cans of pop. When companies produce bottles or cans of pop, the bottling process occurs under very high pressures to ensure that the maximum amount of carbon dioxide stays dissolved in the pop. But once you open up the container, the pressure drops from a very high pressure to a very low pressure. Therefore, the solubility of the carbon dioxide that causes the carbonation in the pop also decreases. So a lower pressure causes lower solubility, and you see this as effervescence or fizz. Once you've opened up any can or bottle of pop, eventually it will begin to go flat because that carbon dioxide has a lower solubility under lower pressures. Changing the pressure does not affect solids and liquids because these are condensed states of matter, meaning their particles are already very close together and not affected by pressure very much. This can also be explained in terms of equilibrium. If you take any gas and you add it to a solvent, you will produce a solution. Notice that there are two substances on the left-hand side of the arrow and only one substance on the right-hand side of the arrow. Increasing the pressure on the system will shift the equilibrium to the side that has a fewer number of substances in order to relieve the stress on the system. Increasing the pressure on the system shifts the process to the right, allowing more gas to dissolve and form into the solution. If the pressure on the system is decreased, the reaction will shift to the left, allowing the gas to escape from the solution. When describing the solubility of solids, liquids, and gases, we use certain qualitative terms. One of these terms is unsaturated. Any solution that is unsaturated contains less than the maximum amount of solute that could possibly be dissolved. Imagine I took a beaker filled with water and I placed 100 grams of salt into that beaker. At first, the salt would begin to dissolve in the solution. If the solute is dissolving or is able to be dissolved, the solution is said to be unsaturated. Eventually, however, the solution will contain the maximum amount of solute that can be dissolved under those specified conditions. And at that point in time, we say that the solution is saturated. In a saturated solution, it's not possible to dissolve any more solute in the solution. Normally, you'll see some undissolved solid present in the container, and if you were to add any more salt to the container, it would just sink to the bottom and not dissolve. These types of solutions would be described as saturated. Notice, however, if I took a saturated solution and I heated it up, we know that increasing the temperature of a solution increases the solubility of a solid, so I would actually be able to get all of that salt to dissolve. Once everything is dissolved again, the solution would be considered unsaturated. Now, if I take that warm solution and I allow it to cool down very, very slowly, I can actually produce a solution that is considered to be supersaturated meaning that it contains more than the maximum that's able to be dissolved. These solutions are usually very unstable. And if the solution is disturbed at all, meaning the container is bumped or one extra little salt crystal is added, all of the excess solute will usually precipitate and fall out of the solution and return to that solid at the bottom of the beaker. Once the precipitate forms, the resulting solution is now considered saturated again. The solubility of different substances can also be quantified by using solubility curves. You can predict exactly how many grams of a solute will dissolve in 100 grams of water 
using these curves. A solubility curve is also known as a saturation curve. So any place along the black curved line, the solution would be saturated. Any amount of solute that is below the curved line would be considered unsaturated, and any amount of solute above the curved line would be considered supersaturated. Notice that for most of the solids in this graph, they increase their solubility as temperature goes up. One exception to that is sodium sulfate, which actually decreases its solubility. The three dotted lines are examples of gases, and notice that all of the gases will decrease their solubility as temperature increases. The rule, like dissolves like, allows us to make predictions about whether two substances will even be able to be dissolved in each other. Compounds that have similar types of bonds, polarity, or intermolecular forces will dissolve in each other. These substances are known as miscible, meaning they'll always mix regardless of how much you use. Substances that have different types of bonds, different polarity, or different strengths of intermolecular forces will not dissolve in each other, and these substances are known as immiscible. Oil and water, for example, are immiscible with each other because oil is a nonpolar substance with weak London dispersion forces, and water is a polar substance with very strong hydrogen bonding. Because the London dispersion forces are not strong enough to overcome the hydrogen bonding, the two substances will never mix. On the left is a chart of substances that are miscible and immiscible in water. Notice that alcohols are usually miscible in water, like methanol, ethanol, and propanol. However, butanol is immiscible in water. The reason for this is because of the number of carbons. Methanol contains only one carbon, ethanol has two, and propanol has three. But a molecule of butanol has four carbon atoms. This creates a larger part of the alcohol molecule that is nonpolar. That nonpolar region has weaker London dispersion forces than the hydrogen bonding of water, and therefore causing it to be immiscible. Finally, there's often an exchange of energy that occurs when solutions form. This amount of energy is known as the enthalpy of solution. When forming a solution, the solute crystal has to be broken apart into smaller pieces in the process of dissolution. The same thing happens with the liquid solvent. The solvent particles also have to spread apart to make room for the solute crystals to go between them. Both processes of spreading out the solute and the solvent require energy to be added to the system in order to overcome the intermolecular forces between the particles. Once the solute and solvent particles begin to interact and go between each other, energy will be released. This is because we're going from a high potential energy state to a lower potential energy state known as the solution. When some solutions form, their enthalpy of solution is exothermic meaning that they release heat into their surroundings. This causes the solution to feel warmer after the substance has been dissolved. In the diagram at the bottom, you can see the red arrow represents the energy required to spread the solvent apart. The blue arrow represents the energy required to spread the solute apart. And the green arrow represents the amount of energy that's released when the two molecules join together. Because more energy is released than is absorbed, the process is exothermic. This enthalpy of solution will normally have a negative value because the energy is being released into the surroundings. The opposite is also true. The enthalpy of a solution can also be endothermic. These solutions absorb heat from their surroundings, causing the solution to feel colder after the solute has dissolved. Again, the red and blue arrows represent the amount of energy required to spread apart the solute and solvent particles and the green arrow represents the energy that's released when those particles join together. In this example, the amount of energy released is not as much as the amount of energy needed to separate the particles, and so the overall process is endothermic. These enthalpy values will have a positive energy associated with them because the heat is being added from the surroundings.